Yep. <laughs> well, uh, Hello, I'd like to welcome all of you to the College of Complexes tonight. Sorry, honey. My name is Tim. I'd like to uh, briefly go over the rules of this endeavor. One is one fool at a time. Second is no personal attacks. To quote uh, Brahm extensively, without further ado, let's give a warm round of applause for Ted Aranda. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Um, let me get started. Thank you. Uh, nice being here again. I published a, a YouTube video, and this is the title, 9-11 Reality and Democracy. And you all can check it out now. Um, I just got it published, and I'd like to pass out uh, a little leaflet, which will give you the title. And it'll also give, us, give you our website, democracyfnews.org, and also, um, what else is on there? Oh yeah, my email address, if you want to contact me directly for any reason. <clears throat> okay, this is the first page I had uh, written comments as well as speech and photographs in my presentation, uh, this YouTube presentation that I just mentioned. And uh, this is kind of the introduction, so I'd like to just read it. If I had to choose one brief statement on 9-11 that summarizes what it's all about in all the reading that I've done on 9-11, it would be this one. The official story of 9-11 is the radioactive core of today's terrorist hysteria the overarching fiction and crime and cover-up of our time. So, given the great importance of 9-11, I think it's critical that we Americans, we Americans, especially activists, get to the bottom of 9-11 and find out what really happened on that day. And just as important, act upon the knowledge that we gain from our investigation. We can't just talk about 9-11 forever. We have to do something about it. 9-11 cannot be allowed to stand. Okay, the first thing I'm going to do is cover very briefly a few things from the last presentation. Some of you I know were there, some of you may not have been there, but a couple of comments were made and uh, other things came up, and I'll cover those before I get into the presentation itself. Okay, um, Don Ritchie is, I don't see him. He made a comment that was astounding to me, and I can't let it go for two reasons. One, because I have to correct what he said, and secondly, it's relevant to our topic of 9-11, believe it or not. And this is, he said that uh, crop circles, you know, they're a hoax, they're fake, they're not real. That's the farthest thing from the truth you could say. That would be like saying the moon is not real. Um, this is one of the largest crop circles, and there have been a number of them, quite a number of them, that have been on that scale. This is called the butterfly man. And that's how big it is. That's a stadium next to it. Um, inserted there for, to give you the scale. It's hundreds of yards uh, wide. <clears throat> and that's an aerial photo to give you an idea again of the scale of this thing. And those are three young men standing in the middle of it, very, in the very middle of it, which would be right around there in that little circle. And I'm, gonna, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time, don't worry, on crop circles, because that's not what I'm going to talk about, but I, very briefly. And you'll notice that uh, right here in this photograph, the intricacy of crop circles, these, um, which we call them, uh, the crops are laid in a very precise fashion. And there are often patterns within the larger crop circle. So they're very sophisticated many times. Aliens, aliens, UFO. And this is an uh, illustration of how they're made. Uh, human beings cannot do this. Scientists can't even explain how it's done. All of those crops, each individual crop, and they're, they're, you know, they're countless of them, like grains of sand on the beach, right, are individually bent at the node, which is like the knee of the crop, uh, the first node, like that. And it's done in a, in a way that, again, is not uh, fully understood. It's not really understood at all, probably. It's done with some kind of radia radio radiation 
or chemical uh, means or genetic means. It's not known. <clears throat> so to summarize, crop circles, oh, this actually, this is more information, not just a summary. Crop circles usually appear overnight in complete darkness. They are produced in only a few minutes, even the very largest, like that one that I showed. Well, actually, I don't know about that particular one, but others that size um, have been produced in just a few minutes. They are often made in patterns, designs of mind-boggling intricacy, precision, and complexity. They often convey very sophisticated messages and themes, including mathematical formulae. They're physically created in a way not understood by humans, much less reproducible by them. And the inescapable conclusion is that crop circles are of non-human, ultra-intelligent origin. In a rational world, they would be of the utmost interest and importance to thinking people. They wouldn't be dismissed so simply. Okay, so the reason, the other reason, the bigger reason that I even bring this up, besides correcting the record on crop circles, is that it has to do with science and scientific thinking. And we need to do this when we investigate 9-11 and things like 9-11 in the political realm. Science, or scientific, scientific thinking, this is cutting out occasionally for some reason. Anyway. Okay, um, should I just hold it farther away from my mouth? Can, can, where is, oh, Tim, can you uh, like over the volume maybe? Uh, Bob says it's kind of distorted. Is, is, how does it sound, folks? How does it sound, okay? I'll try to keep it farther away from my It's okay. okay. Um, science and scientific thinking is not about blind conformity. It's not about comfort zone. It's not about following, I mean, it is about following the facts, laws of nature, and the experimental method, where, wherever they may lead. It's about the discovery of new, more explanatory paradigms. It's about the construction of logically coherent accounts, not the parroting of nonsensical official pronouncements. It's about facing reality. It's about the key to the progress. It's the key to the progress of human civilization in all realms, including the political. Um, Bill Lee, uh, I don't see him here. Last time, commented that um, if you look on the web, you can see all kinds of damage to World uh, Trade Center Number Seven. This is the only photograph I could see, uh, found, and I looked quite extensively, looking for this uh, purported damage, and. There's a question, some people question the authenticity of this photograph, but it would be kind of strange that there was only one. But anyway, let's assume that it's accurate. That's the damage right there to one corner of the World Trade Center uh, tower, seven, number seven tower. Um, there are other photographs that show that kind of thing, but that's not the building burning and it's not damage to the building. In that photograph, there's some superficial damage so that's about it. And that smoke, or, um, yeah, smoke, is, uh, what, yeah, whatever it is, um, is, is not this burning, is not this building burning. It's, uh, no, it, it's probably coming from uh, World Trade Center number one or number two, which just came down, and you all re recall in the photographs and in the, in, the, in the videos, all that smoke coming, uh, coming off of that building as it came down. Uh, dust, yeah, uh, that's, that's actually the word that I wanted. For some reason, I couldn't think of that word. Okay, uh, so even this damage here, though, is relatively uh, insubstantial when you're talking about a large steel frame building. That damage right there is not going to cause that building to collapse at all, much less in a free fall fashion as the videos show. So, World Trade Center number seven was brought down by a controlled demolition, period. End of story. Um, there, are, there were other buildings. Um, this is the, the Bankers Trust building, um, and it was adjacent to the Twin Towers, the World Trade Center complex, and it suffered some uh, fairly uh, significant looking damage. But again, that's not going to, that kind of damage is actually superficial when it comes to the structure of the building. That's not going to bring it down. And that, so that kind of uh, damage. Uh, which is similar to the damage done to the uh, trade, uh, World Trade Center, Center 7 tower, is not going to cause those buildings to come down. Excuse me. Okay. Um, this is the 
video that I showed you last time, which, and I made the claim that because that uh, wing was going behind this, um, that building there, that building right there, which was obviously behind the World Trade Center Towers, that that video was therefore fake. That's false. That's not correct. So I'm correcting the record here. <clears throat> uh, actually, I got that claim from this guy named Marcus Allen. Um, he posted this claim in, in, in a little video on the internet, and it caused a great sensation. Because obviously, if that had been true, it would have been the most obvious fakery in the world. But all this guy Marcus Allen had to do was look at the Hedgehog County video from the very beginning, instead of the short clip that he apparently looked at. That building, uh, that red brick building, is actually in front of the World Trade Center Towers. So if you saw a plane coming through here like this, it would indeed have gone behind that building, just like the video shows. Okay, that's the plane trajectory, because somebody, unlike Marcus Allen, um, uh, took the trouble to go to New York City and find out where that building was instead of making a, such a uh, large plane and posting it on the, on the internet. And so they found out that yes, that's the trajectory. These are the buildings right here, that red brick building, and then the other building next to it. And, and therefore, um, the, the uh, what do you call it, video was not fake for that reason. But even Marcus Allen, as careless as he was, he actually gave that, uh, that plane going behind that building is only the second reason that the video was fake. The first reason that he gave uh, was that you can't have an aluminum plane like that uh, uh, going into a steel tower the way that the show. That's, it can't happen, it's physically impossible. So let's go through that because that reason that he gave is perfectly true. And that's the reason that that video is in fact fake. This is a, a, a um, website where this person who put this website together took that Hedgehog County video and went through it frame by frame in slow motion. So we're going to go through this um, slowly. The first thing I want to do is point out this flash right there, uh, which appears in several of these videos. There were about 50 of these videos made of this plane going, allegedly going into uh, what the heck is maximum security? Just hits the stop button with the mouse. There's no mouse attached. Um, well, let me see. Okay, stop button. Yeah, there. Okay. Okay. Very good. Uh, okay. So, um, that flash there, according to Ace Baker, which I agree with, uh, is probably inserted there by the coordinator of all these videos. Somebody coordinated all the making of all these videos. And they had to make sure that the plane in all those videos hit the building at the same time and uh, location exactly. Uh, otherwise, there would be a whole lot of mismatches, which would prove that the whole business was fake. So that's what Ace Baker, who is a, an expert on 9-11 and filmmaking, that's what he thinks that is, because it doesn't even seem to affect anything. It's probably not physical, because as you can see, it doesn't seem to uh, be a blast that damages the plane or the building. So let's go through this from the beginning. Watch this as this plane, uh, alleged plane, goes into this building. So you'll notice that, um, whoops, I don't like that flash there, but anyway, um, there was no interaction between that plane and that building, none whatsoever. The motion of that plane is as if the building was not there, as if the plane was going through empty air. Exactly. If you took that building away, the motion would be the same of that plane. So this is not a collision at all. Another thing you'll notice is that <clears throat> here the plane is already hitting the building, and absolutely nothing breaks off from that plane. There is no crunching of the uh, building. There is no part of the plane falling off. Uh, there, there's no deviation in the direction of the plane, the plane path. It doesn't change whatsoever. The only thing that you see that they're trying to show you is some kind of damage and some kind of interaction is these ridiculous fuzzy things, okay, which don't seem to correlate with anything real. Um, 
don't ask me what they're supposed to be showing or what they're supposed to be, uh, because there's just fuzzy uh, uh, special effects. Also, they, there's some darkening of the uh, building there, some or the image, but it doesn't. It's not real. Uh, that uh, right wing, for instance, has already gone into the building, and there's not an appropriate hole. In fact, there's not an appropriate hole for the plane at all. That hole, or rather, what had to have been a hole for that plane, uh, for that wing to go in there, apparently closed up after the plane wing went through. Then what is that? <clears throat> so, this is a, a, a plane fakery, and all the um, all those fifty odd uh, videos of this um, alleged impact are are the same. They don't show an actual interaction between this plane and that building. So let's review the actual physics of collisions very briefly. A collision is a short duration interaction between two or more bodies resulting in a force being applied to each of the two colliding objects. The forces, which are equal in magnitude and opposite in direction, cause an acceleration of both objects. Newton's laws of motion govern such collisions. And the law that we're going to look at right now is force is equal to mass times acceleration. That's Newton's second law of motion. These are extremely fundamental laws. They govern how everything is made, how things interact, cars collide, uh, buildings are made, uh, bridges are constructed, everything. Excuse me, I don't talk that much usually, so I get thirsty. Okay, this video, some of you will recall, I showed you in the first presentation, and I cut it down uh, to make it more brief, and we're going to look at it again very briefly. This third focus is going to be run into this barrier, uh, which is like about a two-inch steel thick plate with a large concrete and um, steel, reinfor steel reinforced concrete barrier block behind it. And this is at 120 miles an hour, uh, supposedly the fastest uh, test crash of a car ever. And those of you who are here will remember that the car um, was smashed by the barrier. The barrier smashed the car, and in fact, the car bounced back and um, broke up, was totally smashed. <clears throat> and the barrier itself was not uh, significantly damaged. And we can calculate <clears throat> the force of that impact, and I'm not going to go through all the mathematics. I'll make this very brief, <clears throat> and I'll put it for a purpose. The forward focus decelerates from 120 miles, to, uh, 120 miles per hour to zero miles per hour in 0 0.006 seconds. What is the force of impact? The key... Um, Variables are the weight of the car, about 3,000 pounds, and 0 0.006 seconds. And you come up with a force of about 12 million newtons. Whoa. Newton is, is a, a measure of force, a unit of force. Let me take that many. And that's a large force, but that's uh, not atypical for, um, let's say, cars colliding. You know, this is uh, calculate these things. It's larger than most car collisions, but uh, all car collisions involve very large forces like that. So what would you expect in the case of a 100 ton airliner flying into a 100,000 ton steel tower at 500 miles an hour? All these variables are, uh, variables are scaled up, right? So you would expect the force to be much larger, right? Or at least the same, right? We can calculate that force precisely. <clears throat> A Boeing 767 moves at constant speed through World Trade Center number two. What is the force of impact? Force is equal to mass times acceleration, as always. These laws do not take vacations on any given day. Um, the mass is, of the plane is roughly 100 tons. The acceleration, as we know, and as I calculated, and as others have commented, is zero, or the deceleration. Deceleration, acceleration, it's the same thing. Just negative, a negative sign. So, the mass times zero is zero. The force of that impact, according to the video, is zero newtons. In other words, it didn't happen. Uh, and that's shown by this physical calculation. It's fake, period. So um, I brought my trusty uh, uh, plate, steel plate, and I also brought a, an aluminum plate. 
And uh, I'll bring them out because I'm going to handle them for just a minute. Please uh, excuse me, I forgot about them completely. Oh, they're right here. Okay, here we go. Okay, so this steel plate, as those of you who were here last time will recall, and I passed it around, I'm not going to bother, this time you all can come up and look at the steel plate and the aluminum plate later. But it's very heavy, and you could, uh, you could almost lift weights with this thing, and you don't want to drop it. This and that kind of material is what the towers were made of, obviously. This is a, an aluminum plate. Okay, you could drop it, it's not going to do much damage. This is the kind of materials that the plane was made of, especially the skin. In fact, this is thicker, 50% thicker than the skin of an aluminum uh, airliner. And I did a little experiment using this bar, and here it is. That's the difference, by the way. The, the plate is thicker and seven and a half times, excuse me, the steel plate is thicker and seven and a half times heavier and the aluminum plate. It's more massive, in other words, of course. So I took this little um, bar, which was what was left over after I made that aluminum plate, because I made that aluminum plate from a three foot long, two inch thick, or rather two inch wide bar from Home Depot. And this was what was left over. And I laid this um, little bar over the steel plate, like this. Like that, okay. Mm -hmm. And I took a hammer and I hammered this bar onto the steel plate. And I protected the bar with, with a, a, steel, a small steel plate on top so it wouldn't smash, the hammer wouldn't smash the bar. And, okay. And um, the steel plate was not damaged at all. At all. That kind of surprised me. I expected some kind of damage. Now, this was a collision. And I hammered this uh, bar onto the steel plate about a dozen times. I gave it a dozen good racks. And that's, physically speaking, a collision. And you can see the, um, that there's no indentation there. This right here is only the uh, gray paint being knocked off the steel. But that line right there, that edge, is, is uh, completely undamaged. The steel itself is undamaged. So the only effect on that steel plate was that some of the rust and some of the paint was rubbed off, but the underlying steel uh, was utterly un untouched. On the other hand, the bar suffered a obvious indentation of a millimeter to a millimeter and a half, as you can see on the screen. And it was flattened a little bit. And as you can see here, the steel cut into it sharply. So, as if anybody needed this demonstration to prove that steel is harder than aluminum, but I guess these kinds of things have to be demonstrated, otherwise people will claim that that aluminum plane could you know, smash through that steel building, which they do. So let's look at this from another perspective, this alleged impact. And again, Bill Lee is not here to defend himself, so to speak, but um, he claimed that in the rebuttal period last time, that, yeah, of course this plane could get through that building because it's going so fast, right? And these were his exact words. It's all about speed and mass. Things going real fast, hitting things can do amazing things. Now, there's an element of truth in what he said, so I'm not completely mocking it. But, and I'll get to that in a second. But generally speaking, this is cartoon physics. And this is what 9-11 truthers call this kind of thinking, because it's reminiscent of when the Roadrunner and um, Wiley Coyote would smash into those you know, rock faces in the in desert mountains and leave the cutouts of themselves, right? Of course, that's uh, impossible, and it's back, in fact, it's comical. But what he said about speed and mass has a ring of truth to it, because uh, mass times velocity, or mass times speed, is in fact momentum. That's the very equation for momentum. And when you get objects going, uh, large objects, heavy objects going faster and faster, they gather momentum, there's more energy involved, there, there are more forces involved in the impact, and therefore you have more damage. That's true. 
But that doesn't tell you anything at all about the relative damage. The damage to one object versus the damage to the other object. So let's do a little thought experiment. <laughs> let's take this watermelon. And watermelons, by the way, weigh about 20 pounds. So they're, you know, hefty fruit, right? Hefty objects by human standards. And let's run this watermelon into this brick wall. And I actually went and, and examined this wall. This is not a random picture. I took that picture. I examined this wall, and it's about a foot thick. It's a very well-constructed wall. Double two layers of, of, of uh, brick. So let's say you took that watermelon and just gently um, tossed it into that brick wall. What would happen to the watermelon? And what would happen to the, wa the wall? Well, absolutely nothing would happen to the wall, right? Can we all agree on that? Wet. Hold on, it's going to get wet in a minute. Uh, the watermelon might split, unless it's maybe a very hard green watermelon, but it would just hit the wall and, and come down and fall down. But let's say you took that watermelon and you tossed it as hard as you could at that brick wall. Well, undoubtedly this time it would at least crack, if not split open, and probably split into numerous parts, right? So the uh, watermelon is going to be uh, destroyed, more or less. However, but nothing is going to happen to that brick wall. So let's take a third example, or a third case, um, and you take that watermelon, but this time you get a cannon, a watermelon cannon. This is a thought experiment, so we can do anything we want, right? And this would be like one of those cannons that shoot uh, people out into, uh, in circuses, except that it's especially made for a watermelon, and this, wall, uh, this cannon is going to shoot this watermelon at this wall at uh, hundreds of miles an hour. Okay? Now, this time, what would happen to the wall, and what would happen to the watermelon? Possibly the, dam the, the wall could be damaged, uh, maybe uh, dented, I don't know, I'm not sure. You know, we would have to do that experiment, which wouldn't be that hard to do, by the way, if the government was interested in actually finding out what happened. <laughs> but um, certainly, uh, that watermelon is not going to do terribly a uh, huge amount of damage to that wall. On the other hand, as Bob says, this time the watermelon would be nothing but watermelon juice at hundreds of miles an hour, right? Uh, it would just be splattered against the wall. It wouldn't even come down because it would be stuck against the wall liquid. And why is that? Here you have an object being propelled okay, into a, a, stand, a sitting duck object, the wall, um, but it doesn't smash through the wall, right? It's not, uh, the wall is not significantly damaged. And the reason is uh, Newton's third law of motion, essentially, which is that when one object exerts a force on the second object, the second object exerts an equal but opposite force on the first. There's nothing in this law, which is a fundamental law of physics, which says anything about which object is moving. It's totally irrelevant. A could be moving into B, B could be moving into A, they could be moving into each other. The force is identical. It's the same for each object. And another way, by the way, to, uh, to uh, state this um, law is for a reaction, there's an equal and opposite reaction. <clears throat> so it's the strength, not the motion uh, that counts uh, when it comes to determining the relative damage. The relative damage sustained by two objects in a collision, whether A smashes B or penetrates B or B smashes or penetrates A, is determined not by which object is moving and which is stationary, but by the relative physical strengths of the two objects. In other words, which object is made of strong materials and has a stronger structure. I did another experiment, which I'll go through quickly because I think you are get the point already. Um, where I took that egg and this hammer and that brass cylinder, which is a weight, and uh, hit this uh, drywall, piece of drywall, which is pl uh, gypsum plaster encased in two uh, layers of heavy paper. That was, that's the drywall there, and that's the egg at the bottom. And I tossed that egg as hard as I could at that uh, drywall, and it splattered against the drywall. It didn't even dent it. It just stained it for some reason. Then I took the hammer, and I made that hole. But I didn't really want to deal so much with the hammer, but I wasn't sure that I was going to be able to toss that cylinder through. So I wanted to make sure that I got something through the hammer, and of course, I mean, through the drywall. And of course, the steel hammer went right through the drywall. But then I took this um, uh, weight, this brass cylinder, and I doubted that I was going to be able to toss it through this drywall. Because the drywall, as, as some of you might know, is pretty, dead, is pretty uh, hard to the, to the touch. But anyway, I tossed it in a similar fashion to the way I tossed the egg, right? Identical, more or less. 
and the cylinder made this nice hair, this nice cut out in the shape of the cylinder, um, the outline, uh, uh, rectangle. And of course, the, um, neither the cylinder nor the hammer were at all damaged. So here you have an experiment where I took um, an egg and a cylinder and threw them in the same manner, a, you know, a collision, right? A projectile against a barrier, and you had two uh, completely opposite results. So I made like, this 9 11 law of, phys of collision physics. Um, I'm sure I could find something like this in some textbook, but I didn't research that much. So in a high speed collision between two objects, projectile A and barrier B, A will flatten, shatter, or splatter against B if it is weaker than B. A will completely penetrate B while remaining intact and leaving a fairly clean hole as it passes through, if and only if it is stronger than B. So, obviously, this is an aluminum plane. That's a steel tower. That plane is not going to go through that tower in the manner shown in the videos um, because it's physically impossible. The only way that that uh, scenario could play out uh, to some degree is if that was not a plane at all, but rather a 12-foot diameter steel or lead projectile, like a bullet, right? And, but it's, that's not a bullet. So that scene in those videos, all of them, because they're similar, uh, just from different angles, um, is fake. Let's uh, move on to videos themselves, the videos themselves. This is, these are the only three uh, live broadcasts of this uh, incident. <clears throat> United Airlines Flight 175 allegedly hitting the South Tower. So let's go through these videos briefly. They've got the planes in the top right video and the left video. There they go. Again, in the top right and the left video. And the uh, yeah, the left video. And then the impacts. Now, something strange happens here. Uh, first of all, the upper right one faced the black. Here you have the explosion. And then here you have that explosion. Now, the plane hit the building behind this one. This is uh, World Trade Center number one. Number two is behind it, completely hidden. And here you have the explosion from that building behind uh, the first Trade Center tower. So did you all notice the most peculiar thing of all in these videos? Uh, there was never any plane in um, that bottom right video. Because these are, these are simultaneous. Okay? There's no plane. There never was a plane. Only an explosion. So how do you explain that? Um, there should have been a plane because there's nothing, the, the video is clear every other way, just like the other two, and nothing's blocking it. That The plane would have come in right above that, not right above, it was considerably above that chiron. So how do you explain that? Uh, there's only one logical explanation that I can figure, and that is that this video is the only actual video. There was not a plane at all. The um, plane appears up here because it's doctored in. Okay, that, those two videos are fake. Otherwise, how would you explain that there's no plane here? The only way that I can think of that you could explain that is to say that somebody doctored the plane out. But this is a live video. Nobody's expecting a plane to come in there, and it happens in a fraction of a second. And what would be the motive for anybody to be doctoring this video? No, what happened was that uh, the person that they assigned to do this, because surely they had to assign somebody to fix this video, didn't show up or failed to do his job or his or her job, right? Uh, or even worse for their, from their point of view, they didn't even assign anybody to fix that video. So you only had an explosion. So let's look at, uh, let's see if I'm going to, yeah. Let's look at that leftmost video. That's uh, this video here. There goes the plane, hits the building, and then what's that there? That apparently is the nose of the plane having gone through the entire uh, steel tower. All that steel with the um, 
uh, gigantic core columns, much less everything else. I mean, the whole thing is totally absurd. And that nose appears in several videos, okay? And uh, that's proof of bakery. And I'm going to return to this, that kind of thing in a minute, so we're not going to spend any more time with this. Let's move on to the rightmost, or rather the top right video. This one here, okay? That corresponds to this one, except that the operator of uh, the cameraman uh, that took this shot never got closer than, than, than this spot right here. He was in a helicopter. And uh, so the way he got that other video, uh, excuse me, that, uh, this here, is, that's a close-up. That's a zoom-in. Okay. So let's um, look at this video. Um, this is the, um, what should we call it, the... Trajectory? Yeah, this is the trajectory, the, the path of the plane, okay? And uh, Ace Baker calculated this. Now, this is from Ace Baker's uh, video or documentary, um, The Great American Psy Opera. And, um, so I'm following him with this. So he calculated the trajectory of this plane. So the plane should have been in this video, in, excuse me, in this, in this shot, in this frame. It should have been in this area right here. Mm -hmm. uh, but it wasn't. Should have been there in that frame. Should have been there in that frame, and it should have looked like that. Ace Baker was a film expert. He stuck that video in. He could do that kind of thing. Excuse me. He stuck that plane image in. So uh, that's what it would have looked like. But of course, it wasn't there, and that proves that that video is fake for that reason. And this video is fake for a number of reasons, by the way. And so we're going to continue looking at this video. Um, so here's the guy in the helicopter. He got this close, and how did he get that shot? Oh, uh, let me put, let me back up. Uh, what would he have done logically and rationally if he had seen a plane coming in? Okay, let's say for the sake of argument that there is a plane here, because it would, there would have to be a plane if this was true. If this uh, scene here uh, was a true depiction of what happened, there would have been a plane there, because in a few seconds it's about to hit that building. In that close-up, right? So there, there would have been a plane there. So let's say, for the sake of argument, there is a plane there. What would this cameraman have done? He would have either kept that wide scene because that plane coming in would have been, you know, hugely interesting, right? Or he would have turned the camera to that plane and probably even zoomed in on it. But he didn't do any of that. What did this guy do? He zoomed in to the towers, zoomed in again and zoom in one more time. This is all happening in just a, you know, a few seconds. And finally, the plane appears, clear, you know, clear as day. What does that tell you? He put that plane in there at the last second. And why would he have done that? Because it would have been a lot more work to stick that plane in throughout this entire scene in all of those frames. And people would have looked at that, and he probably just couldn't have done it because he, this is live. He's in the helicopter, the helicopter's shaking. And he, and he made a mistake. In, in, uh, in, in his production, which I get to uh, right now. Wow. This is the guy, his name is Kai Simonson, and he's in fact a professional video faker. This is uh, a, an ad from, of his, and what he does is, uh, as this faker says, uh, real-time full, well actually as his ad says, real-time full motion alpha key, which is another uh, term for compositing or manufacturing images in videos. That's his job. So let's look at that same video a little bit more carefully after the zoom in. There goes the plane, the tip of the plane right there coming in. There it goes. There it goes. And now what do we see? Not only a nose, but a good section of the, of the front of the plane having come through the entire building. And uh, those of you who were here last time remember how I, in excruciating detail, described the, how that building is made with one wall of steel columns, more steel and concrete floors, <coughs> and girders as well, which I, I, that's a different, a whole other story, the girders that were uh, connecting the outer walls to the inner cores. And then you have inner core columns, a whole bunch of them, about this big. Okay, I mean, he won those uh, steel core columns, and then more floors and girders, and, and then another uh, uh, outer column of steel, and that plane is supposed to have gone through there and remained intact and apparently undamaged. Okay, that is fake. Does anybody think that that wasn't fake? 
Okay, we're gonna have to hear from you in your rebuttal on how you can explain that. <laughs> I will. Okay. Okay. The world's flat, right? Yeah, it, 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 it was supposed to have gone through the entire building. Okay, so uh, Peter Jennings on ABC uh, was watching this and he says, watch how the airplane penetrates the building, completely in one side and out the other. And this guy, another uh, anchorman, he says, there it is, there it is, the plane went right through the other side of the World Trade Center. So we're not seeing things here tonight. Every, the whole world saw this plane up, supposedly go through the building, which is a, uh, that's about as real as if I just disappeared in front of your eyes right now. Can I say something about that? You know, there will be a rebuttal time, sir. Okay, or a question, uh, question and answer oh, time, too. Oh, oh, okay, thanks. Thanks. You'll have your opportunity. Well, and I'll be uh, glad to hear from you. Um, so let, let me just get through it. So um, here is the mistake that he made. Uh, Ace Baker described, and I'll just go through it very briefly. He went through it in a whole lot of detail. I'll just go through it briefly. In compositing, compositing consists of uh, having several screens when you're making um, a video or a film, uh, several layers. And so there, was, there was, should have been a screen, this pink thing, and it should have been lined up right here along the side of this tower so that it would have blocked the nose of the plane. But this guy, this is live, he's in a shaking helicopter, and all of this is happening in fractions of a second, so he made a mistake, which is easy to uh, do under those circumstances. And so he was uh, unable to hide the, the uh, nose. But when he found out, he faded to black. That fade to black that we saw earlier is not a random uh, glitch. It's, that's not a, a, a technical glitch. That's a, a, um, a um, purposeful action by the cameraman. And so when we came back, the uh, uh, nose or whatever was probably already gone because he probably removed the image. But even if it wasn't, it would have been hidden by the uh, explosion. And to top it all off, when they, the the uh, TV station showed this video again. They raised this, these chirons all the way up here so that you could never see the nose at all. Sneaky. Right, sneaky guys. They were, the media were in on this plot, if, in case you don't know already. Now, there were witnesses who came out, and very believable witnesses, who said they were right there under the tower looking up. This guy, um, his name is David Hanshu, I'm pretty sure. He's a professional cameraman. Uh, excuse me, a professional photographer. He was under the tower with his camera looking up there, and he saw this. He saw an explosion. And you can see how far out this material goes. I doubt very much that that's, gonna, that's what's going to happen when a plane goes in. But at any rate, he was right there, and he was looking up. He didn't see a plane. He didn't hear a plane. He saw an explosion. And he would have seen the plane, and he would have certainly heard the plane, because a, a plane that close to you at full throttle would probably burst your eardrums. Well, maybe not that. But it, it would have been extremely loud, and you would have seen it. Now, this gentleman, uh, this reporter here was going around talking to people about, hey, did you see that plane? Um, and that guy comes up to him and says, what are you talking about? And this is what he told him. Uh, and he, didn't, he wasn't a native speaker. Uh, he says, witness, no second plane, it was a bomb. And he points to the World Trade Center, uh, number two tower, and he says, bomb in another building, not second plane. That was a bomb. Who said it was a second plane? <clears throat> and Rick Leventhal says, that's what we're told. Of course, that's what we're told, right? A second plane, we saw it on television, so therefore it must be true. Witness, no, I was there. I saw everything. Is he still alive? <laughs> good question. Yeah, that is a good question. <laughs> But uh, you, don't, you might not know how good that question is. Several people, yeah. investigators have been uh, killed in dubious circumstances. So let's move on to the Pentagon, <clears throat> which goes even higher on the level of, of absurdity because there's not even a pretense to show us planes now. Okay, a plane is supposed to go to the Pentagon, where's the plane? There's not even a video. Okay, so in the case of the Pentagon, the plane was supposed to have come uh, through here. With, uh, that was supposed to have been um, Delta, excuse me, uh, American Airlines number 77 coming through here and hitting right there at the base of this tree on this path, like that. And uh, before we move on, I'll have to explain that there are wings, uh, in case you all didn't know, well, I didn't know beforehand, 
that the pentagon is made up of uh, numerous rings, five of them as a matter of fact, from A, B, C, D, and E. And the plane is supposed to come through here and right through three rings and um, come out right on there. And that's the scenario. Um, and by the way, this wedge right here, the Pentagon wall, outer wall, or rather the entire Pentagon, uh, was broken up into wedges, or separated into wedges. One, two, and then go around three, four, five. And this wedge here uh, had, had just had its um, outer wall uh, remade and reinforced. <coughs> Somebody's sleeping. Okay. Keep them away, okay, please. Because it's, it's very distracting. <clears throat> okay, so, and no, no big deal. Okay, so um, this wedge just had, um, yeah, a little bit. Anyways, this wedge just had its uh, outer wall um, made into a bomb blast. Uh, uh, structure. It was made uh, two feet thick with steel and Kevlar mesh and all kinds of stuff. So no plane is going to easily get through that. But not only did it, that plane get through that outer wall, this is the, coming in from the other side, but supposedly it get through three rings, which as you can see are practically three separate buildings, each of them with two outer walls. And somebody calculated that that's uh, six walls, and each of them was at least a foot and a half thick. We're talking about nine feet of walls. So the claim is that this uh, plane was supposed to have gone through like the thickness of half of one of these, like from here to here. That would be about nine feet, right? But if you imagine that as a solid wall, that plane was supposed to have gone through that. Um, again, you know, how many adjectives uh, can you, uh, synonyms for absurd can you come up with? And, and ridiculous. Um, and not only was it supposed to have come through the entire uh, three wings, but come out intact enough for the nose to leave that exit hole. Isn't that nice and neat? Okay. Now experts say even if a nose had, even if a plane nose had gotten that far in, it wouldn't have left a, a hole like that. Uh, that would have, that's a bomb, uh, some kind of blast. It, there's, there's a technical term for it, but these engineers know that kind of thing, and they say that's ridiculous. <laughs> and this is uh, another reason uh, why it's so ridiculous, because a plain nose is hollow. It's not even uh, solid. It's not even aluminum. It's not even, even an aluminum shell. That's fiberglass, because you have to have uh, radar waves uh, come through, because that's, radar, uh, that's a radar antenna in there. It's, a, it's technically a ray dome, radar dome. So here's the scenario. Um, this plane is supposed to come in uh, on a regular flight from a long distance and hit the first floor. That's the official story. Hit the first floor, which you can see already uh, can't be. It would have hit uh, higher than the first floor. And that's uh, significant for, as you'll see here. Here's where the impact point is supposed to have been, according to the official story. The first floor, uh, the official story says, 80 to 90 percent of the damage was done on the first floor because that's where the plane went in. Okay, but the plane could not have gone in the, uh, in the first floor. And even if it did, uh, there's still not enough damage lengthwise uh, for all the wings and all the material. But um, actually, that plane. Yep. Oh, here we go. Okay, that plane had to have hit at least up, up here. And this is why, because these spools, as you can see, are still standing. And uh, they would have been knocked down by a, a plane coming in this low. Uh, they would have been back, knocked down by the fuselage around here and the right engine around here. And you can see that there's no gouge in the lawn where the right engine uh, would have been if the plane was right down on the ground. So the plane had to be at least, uh, the lowest part of the plane had to be at least six feet above the ground. And it's the 757, Boeing 757 which has a fuselage 12 feet in diameter, with engines 7 feet in diameter, which hang about 5 feet below the fuselage. So we're talking about 17 feet from the top of the, um, which we call it, uh, fuselage to the bottom of the engine, um, 12 plus 5, 17 feet, plus 6 feet 
the screws. So the plane would have to be uh, right up on, in the second floor, at least. And there was not even a hole there, because this is the uh, claim, uh, one of the, some uh, people who look at this say this is the hole. Not here, not the alleged uh, impact point, but here. But that's not a hole, technically speaking, because it has a column right in the middle of it. You can't have any 12 foot diameter object go there and leave a hole, leave that uh, column standing there. But anyway, that's where it would have had to hit. And as you can see also, there's not uh, the damage that the wing, wing here, wing here would have caused, and, or the tail. So that hole, such as it is, is completely inappropriate for a plane having gotten in there. As it, again, this is a recreation that tries to show what uh, should have happened, not, not the first floor or the second floor, um, how would that plane, this image is a little too small, just to, for the record, that the plane should have been a little larger, but otherwise it's, it's pretty accurate. <clears throat> and this is a, a detailed high resolution image, uh, fairly high resolution image of the front of the wall where the right wing should have been, which would have been about here. And as you can see, there's no uh, damage, much less a hole, where a wing could have gone, gotten through. And even if the plane had hit down here, as is as, uh, it's alleged, you still have standing columns. And if a wing had gone in through there, those columns would have been smashed. So the official story actually has a catch-22. There's not the appropriate damage on the wall of the Pentagon for a plane to have gone in. So a plane did not go in there. However, there's no wreckage outside of the Pentagon anywhere. So uh, you can't have, the plane could not have gone in, but it's not outside either. So the whole thing is just made up. This guy here is an expert on these kinds of images. He's, uh, his name is General Albert Stoverbein, and he's an, em uh, an expert in imagery. And he says, I look at the home in the Pentagon, and I look at the size of the pl airplane. That was, that was supposed to hit the Pentagon. The plane does not fit in that hole. And he says it as well as anybody. Uh, April Gallup is one of the key witnesses to what happened in, at the Pentagon, or, in, or what did not happen, as the case may be. She and several other witnesses have said that there's no, there's no plane there. I'll just read one or two of these. April Gallup says, um, I didn't. She, by the way, works in the Pentagon. She was there in her office when the plane hit. I didn't see any airplane seats. I didn't see any, any plane parts. I didn't see anything that would give me any idea that there was a plane. I didn't see anything on the lawn. I didn't see, see any luggage or metal pieces. Gallup reported that there was no large fire in the building as one would expect to result from a plane hitting it. She and others did, however, report bomb explosions and the corresponding distinctive smell of cordite, which is essentially gunpowder. And I'll read just one more because I think it's kind of compelling. Uh, I didn't work, he says. I expected to see a plane, so I guess my initial impression was, Where's the plane? How come there's not a plane? I would have thought the, plane, the building would have stopped it, and somehow we would have seen something like part of or half of the plane, or the back of the plane. So it was just a real surprise that the plane wasn't there. And actually, I'll just go in more to the bottom here. Two journalists went in, inside the Pentagon. One said there weren't seats or luggage or things you find in the plane. Another said, I got in very close. I could not, however, see any plane wreckage. And this is on my website, so if you want to look at the other uh, testimony, you can do so on, on the Leslie website, my YouTube video. Gerard Hartman, one of the 9-11 uh, investigators, examined 29 accounts that an American airline, airline had hit the Pentagon. And he uh, reports that a majority of these people did not actually see a commercial airplane hit, hit the Pentagon. They saw a plane flying too low and then smoke or an explosion in the direction of the Pentagon, which itself was out of sight at the time of the collision. Other problems with the testimony include the alleged witnesses not actually being identified. <coughs> so Holmgren summarizes what appeared at first meeting to be 19 witness accounts, uh, plus 10 more later, actually turned out to be none. My conclusion is that there is no eyewitness evidence to support the theory that Flight 77 hit the Pentagon. Similarly, Jerry Russell examined 152 testimonies, and of these, 142 either did not expl uh, provide explicit, realistic, and detailed claims about an airline striking the Pentagon, or, were cont or contained substantial factual errors or contradictions that clearly falsified the account. David Griffin concludes the alleged eyewitness accounts 
are factually problematic to provide support to the claim that O'Brien sent to the Saudi Strip the Pentagon. Corroborating physical evidence would be required, and that evidence does not exist. Of course. So let's move on to Shanksville, and unfortunately for the government, this is not a photograph from Shanksville. Uh, it's from Tallahassee, Florida, and here's a, a Boeing airplane, and guess what? Uh, you can see it in the field. Isn't that a surprise? Um, and it's very large, and there's a semi trailer truck and more trucks and tractors. Uh, that's what you expect to see when you go to a plane crash site. Or you might see something like this, which is a plane completely broken up. This is the Lockerbie, Scotland um, crash. The plane exploded, um, and therefore it's in a bunch of pieces. But you can't come up to this crash site and, and, and wonder where's the plane, right? On the other hand, at Shanksville, where's the plane? How many people have seen this video, this photograph, or another one similar to it? Has anybody not seen that kind of picture from Shanksville? Okay, well, whatever. Um, some of you don't want to admit it, <laughs> I think. Anyway, um, so this, pho this photograph shows uh, like a crater, right? And these other gouges, which were probably made to simulate wings. So the story is that the plane went completely inside that little hole, and the wings apparently, you know, supposedly supposed made those cut out uh, things there, right? That's the official story. <clears throat> because there's no plane there, as anybody can see. And as a matter of fact, when uh, people got closer on the ground, um, there, there was no plane. And that's looking. That, that's the hole right there. That, that's people looking right into the hole, or rather the photographer looking right into the hole. There was a person there, their, their legs, and here's another person. So that gives you the scale of the thing. Um, there was no plane. And the claim is that, as I said, the plane went straight in, and all the way into the ground, right? The entire plane. Uh, and, and the reason that that could happen, they said, was because this is mining country, so the soil was soft. It was worked over, so it was soft, right? Uh, well, first of all, if you think about that for a second, Soil is not just one or two inches. I mean, we're talking about a 150-foot plane going all the way in, so it would have to be soft for 100 or 200 feet, right? Uh, which is ridiculous. But secondly, this is rocky soil. <laughs> there are rocks in this soil, uh, so I don't think it was too soft. Um, and here's another photograph. And this is um, one of the earliest photographs because, now, experts say that this was a bomb crater. And so they set off this bomb, and here it is smoking. And they, by the way, they put a lot of trash in there. People who came up to this scene saw a lot, to the hole that is, they saw a bunch of trash or uh, debris, some junk. Junk is the best word. It was not airplane junk, though. It wasn't airplane parts or anything having to do with airplanes. And that's the scenario of uh, the plane supposedly going through the ground all the way in and being hidden there. Now, if a plane was hidden under the ground, you'd expect the uh, authorities to dig it up, right? And the bodies, right? Did the FBI do any such, or did anybody do any, any such thing? The FBI comes in and, and, um, and, and uh, fills in the hole. <laughs> Immediately. <laughs> so, uh, Assistant Fire Chief Rick King says, where is this plane and where are the people? There are thousands of tiny pieces scattered around, but no fuselage, no wings, only a smoking crater and charred earth. Homer Baron says, it didn't look like a, a, like a plane crash because there was nothing that looked like a plane, just like a big pile of charcoal. And uh, local coroner Wallace Miller said the crater looked like someone took a scrap truck, dug a 10-foot ditch, <clears throat> and dumped all this trash into it. Roger Bailey of the Somerset Volunteer Fire Department thought the crater was a hole that they had dug to burn garbage. Remember um, that and that. So these witnesses are obviously describing what they saw, and what they saw was not a plane. <clears throat> Frank Monaco of the Pennsylvania State uh, Police said that the site looked like a trash heap. There was nothing that, uh, but tiny pieces of debris. It's just littered with small pieces. It didn't look like a plane crash, etc., 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 etc. So there was no plane in Shanksville. Plain and simple. The government, once again, is telling us um, a bald face uh, lie. Okay, so. Yeah, well, there's hijackers, but there were no hijackers. 
Um, nine of them are, are actually alive, or were alive after 9-11. Um, and this is what uh, a couple of them said. I couldn't believe it when the FBI put, uh, put me on their list. <laughs> they, gave me, they gave my name and my date of birth, but I am not a suicide bomber. I am here. I am alive. I have no idea how to fly a plane. I had nothing to do with this. <clears throat> Another so-called hijacker says, I want to think all this is a mistake. Ali Dar was watching TV at home when friends saw his photograph on the news and began to call to see if he was still alive. So, uh, there were no hijackers. Some of those guys were probably CIA assets, uh, like uh, Muhammad Atta, uh, this guy, Hani Anjur. They were brought to the United States to go through the motions of flying, learning to fly a plane, so that they could be blamed afterward. And they were probably paid well, I would imagine, for their <coughs> services. Patsies. Patsies, exactly. So who uh, concocted this wild and murderous scheme? It was uh, the New York government. Uh, Rumsfeld and Cheney were undoubtedly the leaders. Those guys go back together working uh, for the forces of evil uh, for quite a while. These guys, this guy here is actually Richard Pearl. He's called the Prince of Darkness. And uh, that guy is uh, Paul Wolfowitz. He studied under the neo-Nazi Leo Strauss at the University of Chicago. And Dov Zakheim is another one of these intellectual or uh, ideological leaders who wrote books on how the United States should be ruling the world. And um, the neocons formed themselves into, and by the way, there were a lot of more neocons besides these. This is, this is more or less a random photograph from the internet which showed several of them, but there were a lot more of them. They came into the government with uh, George Bush, and they became the government. And they wrote, uh, some of these guys wrote um, this Rebuilding America's Defenses. They formed themselves into the project for the new American century. And what was this PNAC uh, document? It's an orgiastic wish list of new military programs and the outline of a general multifaceted expansion of the war of the U.S. war machine. Its purpose was to control the entire world by subjugating it to American power through military force. And if any, in case anybody thinks I'm, I'm exaggerating here, you have no idea. Because, okay, it's because it's like the Bible of how to go the world. Um, and the premise is that we own the world, as Noam Chomsky likes to say. He, he says that that's, he's characterizing the, the, uh, these right-wingers. And the doctrine um, is what I call the don't even think about the doctrine. Don't dare challenge American supremacy. Now, there's only one problem for the for PNAC and its program, and that was uh, the, they needed a catalyzing event. Um, as this document says, we're building America's defenses. This is the most... Uh, notorious sentence from the entire thing. The process of transformation is likely to be a long one absent some catastrophic and catalyzing event like a new Pearl Harbor. So they have to confront a new Pearl Harbor. So here was the plan. And this is my work. Given what was the stake for the neurocons in 9-11, namely the successful execution of the cherished <laughs> catalyzing event as a key stepping stone to world domination, it is exceedingly unlikely that they would have waited around for a guy in a cave halfway around the world to hatch a plan that they could hitch onto, or dependent on the hijacking of airliners by foreign patsies, an operation in which, I say a million here, but probably a trillion, a trillion things can go disastrously wrong. No, the PNAC cabal, having taken over the executive branch of the U.S. government with its immense capabilities and practically unlimited resources, very carefully, carefully meticulously, and ingeniously planned and carried out 9-11 themselves. So 9-11 was a false flag operation, not a foreign, a foreign terrorist attack. And a false flag operation, for anybody who doesn't know, is a contrived, staged event, usually shocking and deadly, planned by its actual perpetrators to appear to have been done by a supposed enemy. The term comes from naval history. A ship of one country deceptively flying the flag of another is flying a false flag. Such, a, such an operation is used by its perpetrators for a major political purpose like launching a war, a war allegedly in response to enemy attack. And uh, Barry Swicker, who wrote an excellent book. Um, uh, we got a copy yeah, here. You gave it to me. A Yale copy is a great book. Yeah, um, powers of Deception. Yeah, yeah exactly. He, he says, deception, above all, is the key to everything for Reich. And Reich is just the German word for empire. And of course, he's alluding to the German Reich, the Nazi Reich. The leaders are marinated in a complete obsession with lying and deceiving at every turn. Deception is needed to fool the citizenry into relinquishing their civil rights. Deception proceeds and leads to the police state. Deception proceeds and leads to war. 
At every step, deception is required for Reich's gaining and maintaining power and carrying out all its other nefarious actions. So the gold standard for uh, a false flag operation, the quintessential one, was the Nazi regime <coughs> burning down their Reichstag building, which is the equivalent of our universe, of our capital building, or the uh, British Houses of Parliament. This is Reichstag? Reichstag. Wow. They burnt that, and then they claimed that the communists did, by the way. And of course, they, and then they used that provocation, that incident, to say that it, the country was under attack and they had to go conquer the world, oh. essentially. Oh. And of course, so they attempted to do just that, this at is, least Europe. This is sick. So the yeah. America, uh, excuse me, the uh, Nazi um, regime, the German Nazi regime, had its rights tag. Um, the American fascist regime has its 9/11 had and has to this day. It's 9-11. And they use it, they have used it and continue to use it to go uh, chasing boogeymen, carrying on their ridiculous war on terror, uh, invading and destroying other countries, and killing uh, countless people. So how is it that um, a supposedly wonderful nation like the United States could do something like this, or could, uh, its leaders could get away in, in doing something like this. And <clears throat> part of it has to do with the myth or faith of the United States. As Doris Hooker says, the official 9-11 story is embedded in the official myth of an entity called America, which essentially could do no wrong no matter how much contrary evidence exists. David Ray Griffin says, although America is generally regarded as a basically Christian nation, another form of faith is more pervasive and more fundamental. That is, the faith in the essential goodness of America and its leaders. This faith implies that although our leaders may, be sometime, may sometimes be incompetent, they will never deliberately do something horrendously evil, especially to their own citizens. Now, the reality is exactly the opposite. As uh, Colonel Shelton Langford says, your countrymen have been murdered, and the more you delve into it, the more it looks as though they were murdered by our government, who used it as an excuse to murder other people thousands of miles away. And Morgan Reynolds, um, a 9-11 uh, researcher, says, if 9-11 was an inside job, then I'm ruled by monsters. We Americans have to face up to the sheer, unmitigated depravity of our government. As the agent of the country's ruling elite, it truly, literally, wants to dominate the world at all costs, physical, that is, in lives, economic, and environmental. 9-11 makes nonsense of any notion of pressuring our elected officials or holding them to account. They're cold-blooded, maniacal mass murderers. We have to face this harsh reality, or we face extermination. When reading the truth of 9-11 lays bare the true nature of our government. Yes, yes. It is a self-serving oligarchy through and through, not a democracy. True democracy, the variable rule of the people, is what both the United States and the rest of the world desperately need. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Psychologist Martin Schatz uh, makes a key distinction between belief and knowledge. He says, it is important to understand that one of the primary means of immobilizing the American people politically today is to hold them in a state of confusion in which anything can be believed but nothing can be known. Schatz draws a distinction between believing and knowing. With mere belief, there is doubt, room for debate, and thus one is not in a position to draw any firm conclusions and there is nothing to be done. The U.S. government does not have to keep us in total ignorance of the true nature of 9-11 to be able to use it successfully in the guise of the sacred story of holy America attacked by evil Muslims as the basis for its program of imperialism abroad and fascism at home. It merely has to keep us contained in a ghetto of half-knowing regarding this seemingly inscrutable phenomenon, and we therefore end up doing nothing about it. It's time for us to be much more definitive and conclusive regarding the basics of 9-11. Absolute certainty is not possible in any criminal investigation. But proof beyond a reasonable doubt is, and this is what we have with 9-11. The U.S. government is guilty of the mass murder of thousands of its own citizens on September 11, 2001. The American people must proceed and act upon that basis. Wow. Um, so there's this term called guilty demeanor in law, and the U.S. government exhibits all kinds of guilty demeanor, which means basically you're acting like you're guilty because you are. Um, and some of those 
uh, guilty uh, activities or actions are outright lies. That's a uh, government spokesman uh, saying there were no explosions at all at the World Trade Center Towers when there were hundreds reported by many people. Uh, I should say there were many explosions reported by hundreds of people. Uh, prevention of a farcical, farcical investigation. Uh, there were countless egregious omissions and other fabrications in the 9-11 Commission and NIST reports. And NIST is the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is supposed to be scientists looking objectively at evidence. Uh, but they just fabricate uh, using computer models and um, fudging everything, okay, just fabricating all kinds of nonsense. Refusal to divulge absolutely crucial, decisive information, like the Pentagon videotapes. Why couldn't the Pentagon just show us uh, the planes on the countless, you know, the tens and dozens of videotapes that undoubtedly existed, which right. would have shown the plane if there was a plane? Right. They can't do that because there was no plane. Uh, there was no one held responsible that is fired or demoted for 9-11 failures. In fact, they were promoted. The events and their results were the desired outcomes. That's the uh, conclusion we have to come to. Removal of evidence from the crime scenes, and this is one of the worst. Much of the physical evidence was destroyed without examination. That in itself, and this is uh, Michael Rupert talking, suggests guilty knowledge on the part of whoever depicted this destruction, or directed the destruction of evidence at a crime scene. Uh, Barry Swicker says, tampering with and especially rush removal of evidence is tantamount to proof of involvement in the crime. When the tampering reveals the pattern of cover, the likelihood of guilt escalates. So, <clears throat> I said that we have to go from talking about guilty demeanor to talking about these uh, guys uh, being guilty. When an individual citizen, or, or excuse me, while an individual citizen must be presumed innocent until proven guilty in a court of law, the government is the court of law. It is the ultimate authority and as such cannot be brought to trial. After behaving in a thoroughly unaccountable and indeed patently guilty manner, they will not admit to having committed master's crimes, nor honestly investigate itself, much less voluntarily relinquish power. It therefore cannot be given the benefit of the doubt and allowed to slide. It must be presumed guilty and gotten rid of, for it manifestly no longer served the people, if it ever did. The people then have no choice but to remove it and replace it by whatever means they do necessary. And I was going to go through a Star Trek episode very briefly, but I'm not going to bother. I'll just recommend to you that you look at that. It's on YouTube, and the children shall lead. And it will have some very obvious and very powerful messages for you if you bother to check that out. Thank you. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, one more thing. Um, we, Democracy uh, for the USA, are forming a new group. Uh, and it will be something like a committee or coalition or whatever. I mean, we're not sure. If you all are interested in this, it's going to be to combine the goals of uh, the 9 11 Truth Movement with a revolutionary program to achieve democracy. Uh, feel free to contact me uh, t tonight or any other time through email and let me know if you'd be interested. Thanks. Okay. Bravo. All right. You want to take questions now, Ted? All right, Brom, I think, uh, why don't you go ahead and get questions started? We'll go till about 8.20 and then we're going to do a hard stop for rebuttals. Very good. How many people here have questions? One, two, yeah. three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 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 did you run these pictures, for whatever their value, uh, did you run these pictures by uh, demolitions experts? I don't mean armchair demolitions experts, but I mean people who have spent a lifetime blowing up things, either for the military or in the mining industry or, or, or what have you. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering about those explosions, and I'm, I'm wondering if they've actually been looked at by what reasonable men would consider to be competent experts. And I would include uh, people from the Army Ordnance Department. I would include people from the mine, uh, mining industry, that kind of thing. OK, well, I didn't interview anybody. But um, would it satisfy you if I told you about a couple of guys, um, their testimony on the internet? 
interesting. Yes. Okay. Um, there was one, um, and I told, I mentioned this a long time ago in a rebuttal for another presentation, um, but many of you won't remember. There was this one um, Danish, I think, uh, expert, explosives expert, like exactly like you're talking about, and um, somebody, or I guess a 9/11 investigator, showed him, the, showed him the um, video of, of World Trade Center Seven coming down. Now he didn't know that this had anything to do with 9-11. They showed him the video and he said, and they asked him uh, what brought this building down. He said, uh, controlled demolition, what are you, some kind of idiot? And um, they, they told him uh, right afterward, that came down on 9-11 um, and it's claimed that that came down through some other means. And he said, no, no, that's silly. This was done by experts. It was a very well uh, done job um, and there's no question about it. Uh, another person is Jesse Ventura, believe it or not. He was in the military, and he was an explosives and uh, demolition. In fact, he was a demolition expert. Okay, and uh, he testified that he knows about these things. Um, and he said, uh, "All the coming down of those buildings uh, show all the hallmarks of um, controlled demolition." Now, uh, this might not satisfy you, but it's it's important to me whether or not uh, these experts are, or rather. Um, Academics or whatever are specifically specifically controlled demolition experts. Many of them are physicists, um, architects, engineers, and they know about the building, uh, the making of these buildings, and why and how they would come down. And countless of them say those buildings came down through controlled demolition. No question about it at all. Okay. You would agree, however, that it's a long shot, be pun intended, between an architect or a physicist. And a guy who spent maybe 20, 25 years blowing things up? There, uh, it depends, because a guy who spent years blowing things up might not understand the physics of it, and a physicist might look at uh, the evidence and, and conclude through other means, through other logic, through other expertise, that that, is, uh, that came down from controlled demolition. They might know about controlled demolition, even if they haven't been uh, doing it literally themselves. So I would take both. Okay, next. Uh, Dan? Dan. Okay. Uh, Dan. Uh, Dan. Dan. No, you're next. Dan, you're next. Okay, this way. I'm not sure. Uh, uh, just uh, looking at the history of the last uh, 12 years, since 9-11, there appears to be hundreds of thousands at least of people who are in on A lot of them, some of these guys are professional people. I talk to them and say you're crazy. College professors, intellectuals, you know. And I get a sense that there's a big conspiracy to go along with the broad story, you know, of September 11th. But the question is, is there somebody like Snowden or private Manning or somebody who was inside who has felt guilty conscience or something and comes out and says, hey, you know, this was an inside job. Is there anybody from the inside that has made that kind of declaration? Um, not that I know of. Um, I, I was told that, uh, or I, I suspect that Edward Snowden might know more, or might know some stuff about this, um, and he might drop it on the U.S. government at some point. I'm not sure about that. But, um, no, I don't know any, any such, uh, I can say that there, there are some professors who, alluding to uh, something they said about professors, who have lost their jobs because they've spoken out um, um, and, and, and been investigating 9-11. But no, I don't know about any like little insiders. But this question has come up before, and the way I look at it, that's not so improbable that you wouldn't have anybody coming, coming out very publicly because they might be shot at the next minute. Um, <laughs> So okay. About that Next. Okay, Dan. All right. Um, well, you said there were, there were three yeah. witnesses who saw something. I mean, how many witnesses were there that didn't see something? And also, when when three people see a murder, they might see three different things. So I mean, witnesses are notoriously unreliable. <laughs> Well, first of all, <clears throat> most of the evidence that I rely on, and, and, and in fact most 9-11 uh, researchers, uh, researchers rely on, uh, isn't from witnesses. It's from physical uh, characteristics of all kinds of things happening. I had a lot of witnesses. Oh, oh, right, right, right. Okay, I was thinking of the, of the, of the, the Twin Towers specific, more, more specifically. Um, 
another thing is that you have to examine the witness accounts themselves. Okay, some witness, witnesses uh, might say, well, I saw a plane. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah? What kind of plane? Oh, I don't know. Uh, did you hear a plane? I don't know. Okay, so you have to examine the, and some of these researchers have examined a lot of witness accounts. Now, some witnesses uh, are more credible than others, and some of those very uh, much more credible looking witnesses or seeming witnesses have said that they saw no plane. But um, when you have a mass of witnesses like a Chinesville, which I showed you, um, they come out and, and, and explicitly say there's, there's, there was no plane. How do you explain that so many apparently honest people, who probably weren't paid, because who would be paying them, right? The people who would be paid and, and, or threatened or whatever uh, would be the people who would go along with the official story. So what would be the motive for these people uh, who would go against the government? So you have to look at the logic of it. You have to examine the individual testimonies. You have to look at the mass of There's a way to look at it. Um, I wouldn't dismiss testimony altogether. But me, personally, I uh, most of all rely on the physics of these plane, uh, alleged plane strikes into the World Trade Center Towers, which has nothing at all to do with physics. Right. Thank you. Okay, now we're, we're moving in this direction. Who was next? This, this I think she was next. It's moving. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious why yeah, you not chose not. to. What? Uh, you know, th this has been rehashed a lot for years and years. And um, I'm rather surprised that you did not take it from the point of motive. Um, I mean, your, your philosophy about what the uh, neocons were trying to do, I think, is very valid. But uh, it's a little bit vague for true believers. You know, they just can't swallow that. And, uh, but there, there is a whole paper trail of how it was set up. Yep. Asbestos violations, the... Um, the the Port Authority wanted to get rid of the building, but they couldn't demolish it because of the asbestos, and so they, they leased it to Silverstein, who yep. got an insurance policy for, uh, for terrorism insurance from George Bush's <laughs> brother's insurance company, yeah. and on and on and on. I mean, it, and, yeah. I mean, it's just so huge. That, uh, but, and you didn't, you didn't choose to take that approach at all. And, I mean, anybody that watches crime movies on television knows you follow the money trail. Well, um, there are different avenues, there are different ways to approach this, there are different uh, methods to approach this, and many people have, and I'm familiar with some of these that you're talking about, and I value those as well. <clears throat> so I could ask them, uh, many of those people who look at the, uh, this is a crime, and look at motives, and look at the money trail, they might not look at the physics of it. So we each have uh, our own point of view. This is such a large um, operation, it's such a large phenomenon, that there are many ways to look at it. So why don't you do a presentation on, on those topics, and I would be very happy to hear you. That's actually a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Ted, you just uh, sign up for September 5th. That's open. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> <coughs> Who has another question going in the circle? The, the lady in red. Way in red back like there. Hi. Yes, um, I was wondering, um, you said that we, this cannot stand, I agree with you, so what can we do? Okay, uh, that's the um, $6 million question. And I seriously think that uh, we have to start uh, a revolutionary movement, and, and I, I mean that very uh, literally, very uh, seriously. <clears throat> you can't approach this in a piecemeal fashion. You can't go uh, do some little protest. You can't call for an investigation. Who's going to investigate? It would end up being government-picked uh, uh, persons. Um, you can't write your congressman. Your congressman's going to laugh at you. Uh, you can't uh, vote for John versus. Dick, uh, because John's an asshole just like Dick. I mean, so you actually ha have to uh, talk about changing the entire system uh, and um, removing this, ki this government and this kind of government and putting another uh, form of government in place. And then people would, like you and I and ordinary people in common sense would have power. And then we would we'd be long past 9-11 by then. We might not even be that interested in even uh, bothering with these guys because we would be on into a new era. We would be into literally uh, a better world, w well into it, if we were to do that. Uh, but that's what it's going to take, because the United States government is the most powerful entity on Earth. You're not going to uh, be able to 
uh, ding and dent uh, this this thing, this monster. You're gonna you have to uh, attack it and bring it down, and that's gonna be a big job, and uh, that's called revolution. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, all right. Next. Let's, uh, thank you, Gail, for your question. Yes. And the, I'm sorry, I've not gotten your name. Jared. Uh, it's, it's a comment on the field comment on this. People might want to read the American Prospect uh, magazine this year, this month, writing about plutocracy and inequality. I totally support what you say. American Prospect? Yes. Okay. Is that all oh, yeah, That's what you had to say? Okay, thanks. Okay. Next. Okay. Uh, David Travis? Uh, yeah, you said something about a revolutionary starting a revolutionary movement and uh, about uh, a better world. Yeah. Uh, is this would this be the uh, better world that uh, Lenin promised to the Russian people, or <coughs> would this be the better world that uh, Mao promised to the Chinese people, or would this be the better world that was promised to the North Korean people? Um, I would choose the North Korean example. Yeah. yeah. Kim, Kim, Kim Il Sung was it? <laughs> okay. No. Just take your uh, 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 question seriously. <clears throat> there have been revolutions that have uh, put in um, new uh, dictatorial, um, very bad regimes. That's not my model. Revolution is a broad uh, phenomenon, and we would have to craft one that is actually a democratic revolution, not a um, authoritarian, um, bad revolution. So, very briefly to answer your question. Then you must be talking about the Cuban Revolution. Of course. <laughs> Next what? question. What? Uh, in the uh, speech in, on your writing on the board there, uh, you you had at least two high-ranking, uh, high when I say high-ranking, high in a side high-ranking youth military types, including the guy from the Air Force. And he was saying what you were trying to say. Now, is he a left wing communist or he, like me, want to know the truth? Or ain't scared to speak about the truth? Um, he's like that guy Stubblebine. Uh, um. it, it, it was the one guy is up there with, from the Air Force. Uh, Air Force, United States Air Force. Mm -hmm. And he was saying what you were saying, that they don't play the wheel or, or whatever it was. In other words, <laughs> And this is for the audience. Mm -hmm. Is everybody right way when they talk about uh, uh, what's real? Uh, uh, communists because they talk about what's real? Uh, is they are independents right. that look it and see it yeah. and hear it and had So is these people soldiers? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they, 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 you remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's, uh, people from all walks of life in every uh, um, profession, um, some of those people want to know the truth. Uh, and those people happen to be in the military. As a matter of fact, many of them know what, what kind of thing is going on and what's possible, what's not possible. So they're some of our more valid, most valuable experts. And that especially goes for Air Force pilots. There's a whole Pilots for Truth uh, group uh, for 9 Truth, and their testimony and their expertise and, uh, is very valuable. Military, military intelligence professionals for truth also. There you go, military intelligence professionals for okay. truth. Hundreds of them. Next. Okay. Charlie Yeah, Ted, you seem to like experiments, and and you seem to think it was a controlled demolition. But I looked at these experiments on the internet, and they tried to take thermite, and they couldn't get an explosion. They couldn't get it to do anything. Mm -hmm. It's stuff that's used for kids to make spark toys for kids. It ain't no good for blowing up buildings. So the burden of proof is on you. That was a good part of the mission. I don't know how you did it, but mostly, who did it? You mean you have no one who came out with a tell-all? You need quite an army of people to do all these buildings. Okay, what's the question? Where are your witnesses? Um, and what about these experiments <clears throat> that show it didn't work? Okay, um, if you're talking about thermite, oh, let me address your point about thermite. 
<clears throat> I don't uh, have much to do with, with thermite because I know about these objections to thermite. Some 9-11 investigators uh, turn to thermite as being like the, the uh, explain all. Okay, and uh, you're right that um, thermite is not an a, um, explosive. It's not a uh, I forget the other technical term, but it doesn't it doesn't explode. It it, it just burns hot. So what did they use? Uh, they could have used RDX and other uh, uh, high explosives, the kinds of explosives that are, in fact, used to bring down buildings, um, those plus uh, even more explosive versions of those. Now, secondly, um, the U.S. Uh, military or the U.S. government, um, at Livermore Labs or wherever, could, uh, some people have noticed or noted and told us that U.S. government, and people who would know, the U.S. government is decades ahead of, of the ordinary uh, citizen and the ordinary academic in terms of knowledge of uh, new technologies. So the U.S. government could have used thermite or some variation of it or in some way that we don't even know about. Uh, but I do, don't depend on thermite. Now, what I look at, uh, I kind of follow Julie Wood's uh, method of investigation which is that she looks at the plain evidence. You don't have to be um, engine an engineer. It, it helps to have engineering background or a rudimentary knowledge or to investigate you know, engineering principles. But you don't have to be an engineer or a demolition expert to see that, that building, those buildings were blown up. Um, it's as plain as if the chandelier fell, and I told you the uh, uh, chandelier fell. Okay? Things, some, some things are as plain as day. Um, I can't they, tell me what blew up the building or who did it. No, I don't so know. So what's plain about it? I told you what's plain is that the building came down from explosions. That doesn't. Jimmy Wood says it was a gizmo was aimed at the building and kind of like vibrated it. Yeah, she she talks about. She doesn't what? say that, that there was explosives were used. Uh, she she said when I when I referred to Judy Wood, uh, what I was referring to specifically <laughs> is that she looks at uh, the phenomenon of this uh, building coming down uh, through non. Uh, uh, not through a fire, not through natural causes. She uh, talks about uh, a directed energy weapon. Uh, other people talk about thermite. I think it, it might have ha have been um, uh, ordinary, more ordinary explosives on a larger scale. And other people have other ideas. What I say is obvious is that the building came down through uh, unnatural, uh, purposeful, uh, technological demolition. We still uh, we don't know using what yeah. or by you. Yeah, I don't know. We don't know all the details. Well, I don't know all the details. That's, that's why we need know. a new investigation. Exactly, and that's why you need an actual investigation, and that will never happen, the real investigation, until we get rid of this damn government. Can I ask okay. a question? Right. Um, I, um, I was a little concerned about, I think it was the first question, um, when he asked about um, demolition experts and whether they viewed it and what they think about it and you named one I think you said one demolition expert I believe and my concern is that that's just not enough I feel like you need you know you know if you just have one person that's just not he could be a not he could be psychotic he could be anything so I suppose my issue is uh, should you have a whole slew of demolition experts who have looked at these tapes and and, and seen that, that that caused them to go down? And then my second question uh, was just kind of follow up. Um, no, just my question was, was um, um, I, I, well, I put that what a follow up on what he was saying. My, my concern is that do you have to say that there was you know, like new technology that maybe the government had or maybe it didn't have in order to take down all these buildings and do all this stuff on 9-11? I suppose you're saying you don't. Okay, to answer your first point, I mentioned two uh, demolition experts. <clears throat> there could uh, very well, undoubtedly, there are many others. There, there might be uh, dozens or even possibly hundreds. Um, I only did so much research, okay? Um, what we could use is, is literally an, an agency, uh, like one of our vaunted um, U.S. government agencies, like the EPA, or, or take the uh, Attorney General's office, the Justice Department. How many experts, how many uh, uh, forensics ex experts do they have? They have thousands, hundreds of them, right? There's a whole government agency set up to investigate these kind of things, but they're not doing that. 
So to answer your question in the manner that you might be satisfied, you would need not just uh, one uh, individual investigator or even a, a few 9-11 uh, investigators uh, who are like amateurs, but you would need uh, a whole agency with all kinds of experts. But we're not going to get to that point until we do something with the people that we have and the knowledge that we have and the investigations that we have. And I think that is enough. The way that I described it, uh, what happened and what didn't happen, and the way that many others have uh, described it, if you look on in, in the internet, if you read these books like Andy has, uh, there will be a body of, of, of thought and evidence and argumentation uh, that I think is, in and, in and of itself, without going to other experts, I think that's adequate to explain what happened and what didn't happen. Okay, I have questions. Okay, let's... Uh, did you, in all the tapes you saw, did you run across the videos of the live uh, broadcasters during the day using the term controlled demolition, saying, you know, didn't that look like an old hotel mm -hmm. coming down? Yeah, yeah. And my, it's my impression that there's a lot of videotape out there that the, 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 the live broadcasters themselves on the ground were, pro, were knew they were looking at controlled demolitions, and they were reporting hearing the bombs and the blasts go off as each of these buildings came down. Did you see that too in your yeah, yeah, research? Yeah. There's a lot of that. Um, in the original, the first um, TV broadcasts, uh, especially the live ones, right, you know, at the time it happened, uh, a number of those people on the air said, that looks just like a joint demolition. Um, and uh, I think Tom Brokaw, one of the most famous uh, anchors, said just that. But that kind of reporting stopped very quickly because they were given the message um, that, you know, you can't be talking like that because the media was in, uh, as you know, the media was in on the scam. So that kind of reporting um, came to a dead halt, as far as I could tell. But it controlled demolitions from the bottom up. Goof most of uh, To answer uh, uh, um, your question, Charlie's question, on my um, uh, website, uh, excuse me, in this video, this YouTube video, uh, there's a section where I go through controlled demolition. I didn't contr talk about controlled demolition in this in this one at all because I have only a limited amount of time. Okay, can you move over a little bit? This way. Yeah, that way. Okay, that's good. That's good. All right. Um, I think. Question back there. One more question. One more. We yeah. have a question over here. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I have both a comment and a question. Okay. okay. I'm a, a chemist uh, by profession, and I'm also an engineer. I worked over at IIT uh, in their uh, engineering research department, and I tested uh, jet fuel uh, for NASA in, that they use in these planes. And, and, and I want to pose this question to you. Do you think that it's possible for a plane to impact a tall structure, you know, like, like that building that has anchors that go down into the bedrock? Okay, you know, the mantle, it goes down to the bedroom and it's anchored there. So, and they're also built uh, with a mesh uh, because they know there's the potential uh, that uh, a flying object could impact and try to strike and bring it down. Uh, I know that jet fuel uh, does not burn that hot, and for that reason, the steel inside of, of such a tall structure, because I, I, my area of specialization, I worked in metal finishing and was an electroplating chemist. In my, when I first started out, and I used to analyze gold and metals, and I did uh, a heat treating, a case hardening, and all that sort of thing of the same steel beams that are inside of these buildings, uh, you know, back in the 80s. Uh, my question, I want to do you think that the jet fuel could possibly be hot enough to, to make uh, steel not, not melt, obviously, to even make it buckle so that such a tall structure would collapse under its own weight? Okay, uh, obviously that's a rhetorical question because you're the expert, right? <laughs> but I um, heard uh, the same thing that you're saying from other experts in my research. And uh, again, this is on my larger uh, uh, video uh, on YouTube. Uh, did you get uh, this flyer? Uh, no, I have not. Okay, um, anybody who didn't get this flyer should uh, get a copy. Um, and you can look at my video, and I talk about that. Um, and basically, uh, this, the towers, uh, the fires in the towers were way too cool to uh, melt steel or even weaken steel. And many experts uh, say that, therefore, you couldn't have had the building uh, come down from fires. And in fact, at the last, um, my last presentation, I touched on that as well. There uh, have been um, many uh, uh, very large and intense fires, longer and larger than those at the World Trade Center towers, 
that have, and none of them have ever brought down a building uh, for a simple basic physical fact that you know is better than any, most of us here, uh, which is that jet fuel burns at around 1800 degrees, uh, the steel melts at around 2800 degrees, uh, when those uh, alleged planes uh, hit, if there had been planes, uh, the kerosene would have burnt away uh, in the initial fireball and, and instantly, most of it, uh, the rest of the uh, uh, jet fuel would have burnt away in a few minutes, and what you would have had left was just often office material burning, um, and that uh, burns at much even lower than 1800 degrees. So you had thousands of degrees, or many hundreds of degrees, uh, a deficit between the kind of heat that's necessary to destroy steel towers, uh, and um, so it's, it's impossible. And, and let me also add, uh, the fuselage that is obviously contained in the wings would have, uh, they would have hit the face of the building and fell off, and we want to say how, what percentage of, of that fuel would have actually soaked into uh, a, a non-porous building and, 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 and uh, drenched it enough to uh, potentially elevate uh, uh, these high-level temperatures to buckle uh, metal. That's just impossible. Right, right. It could never happen. Right. And another thing uh, to consider um, is that um, the fires were pretty localized. Um, and so the fires would have gotten very hot, uh, or as hot as they, whatever, however hot they got, they would have gotten to that temperature only in a very small area, and then a lot of that heat would have been dissipated through all those uh, uh, um, columns and girders uh, which the building is made out of. So um, the, there was no way, as you well know, um, that that, uh, could have, that fire could have brought down those buildings. Yeah. Okay, uh, this lady has last a question. It's the comment period. Okay. No, no, well, tell Anyway, Judy Wood does have a video out where she claims to be uh, part of a, a team that created the uh, material that melts uh, steel and cement. Yeah, you got still one? On there, I can still see. On and, and this is a, a video by Judy Wood. Okay. Okay, I think Lana's got well, one question. You think it's your report is when it's We do want to give you the recovery period. The question is how many people have statements to make? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, let's thank Ted for five minutes. How much? I have a question. Well, come on, you can make come on. He had a question before, question didn't he? As your state. Yes. 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 One oh, hit. you're gonna use that, huh? Yeah. You don't need this. Thing. Yeah, you, yeah, you do. Oh. Dead, dead. So everybody can see how to. Dead. Yeah. My, my favorite subject. Okay, <laughs> Lana. How long? How long? She's five minutes. Can sale. we go four? What? I just I just want to go four because I think we got a lot of speakers and we want to get going. Okay. Yes. What? Uh, no. Let's go with four minutes. All right, when you're ready, we'll start. You can see it right here. Ready? Hi. Uh, my name is L.P. Anderson again, Andy. And, uh, yeah, hold on, Tim, let me put the mic on. Okay, yeah, no problem. We'll clear it. Got it, Andy? Thanks. Let's just wrap it around two, three times. Okay, can everybody hear me all right? Yeah. All right. Uh, you can watch videos for uh, dozens and dozens of hours. There's probably hundreds of hours of videos you can watch on this subject. Uh, I prepared a, a, a brief, uh, when I'm talking to seventh graders in science or anybody else that uh, has, you know, a sixth or seventh or science grade edge, eighth grade education. You, you start with simple basic facts that are generic, that like, 
you know, at some point kids are learn that the sun rises in the east. The earth is round. The earth rotates. The earth is not the center of the universe like the Catholic Church prosecuted Galileo for. Uh, there's, you know, Ted talked about a ton of forensic evidence. The people in the audience here tonight were asking questions about specific pieces of forensic evidence. And on each one of those pieces, there's literally hundreds of scientists around the world uh, that have been working on each piece. There's hundreds of thousands of people worldwide in the so-called citizen-driven 9-11 educational investigational movement. It's not one or two people with an opinion. It's a giant database of evidence. Does everybody understand that? Like a database on asbestos. It's not one person's opinion. Database on the healthful benefits of smoking four packs a day. We, we, we could have a debate on that, but the debate would be from some guy that's paid by the tobacco industry to stand up here and lie to us. Uh, there's the three basic facts. I'll repeat them. Number one, all seven of the Trade Center buildings were destroyed with explosives that day. The media told us that two towers came down. They didn't tell us about the third tower that wasn't hit by a plane. All seven buildings that were slated for demolition and they wanted to build something more profitable on the site. You start with that fact. All the photographs show it. Seven buildings were virtually wiped out. Second thing, three, three big towers were demolished, not two. In all the anniversary uh, shows, you see the two lights going into the sky, as if only two towers were demolished. The third tower was only 47 stories high. That would have been a big building in 33 different states. That tower came down at 5.20 in the afternoon, and Jane Stanley from the BBC and a couple other people were out there with microphones reporting the collapse of the tower and reading the script 25 minutes before they triggered the explosives. The media had the script that day. The whole thing was scripted from day one, and it was sold to us as a Hollywood extravaganza, starting with the cameras positioned on the Twin Towers in the morning. The third fact is that the Twin Towers weren't just demolished. The physicists, when they started investigating this, physicists for 9-11 Truth, they said, we had to invent a new word for what happened to these buildings. They were dustified. They were converted to dust. Hundreds of thousands of tons of dust a lot of the dust particles were uh, smaller than a red blood cell. There's microscopic dust uh, in, in uh, some bigger chunks, but basically the pile of rubble on the ground was non-existent. It was almost level because the two twin towers were converted to dust and rolled over to lower Manhattan as a cloud of dust. You start with those three facts. There's a, a forensic evidence sheet with references listed on it. Uh, if you don't have time to read 100 or 200 books, this is a summary. Uh, I've read 50 books on 9-11 and watched hundreds of hours of video, thousands of pages of testimony. It's all over the place. The database is huge. 9-11, let me finish my thought. 9-11 is being used to drive America toward global dominance of the oil industry, oil and energy. Professor Griffin, who has written yes. 10 books on 9-11, this is his new book, Unprecedented. It talks about what the human race needs to do. Everybody's asking Ted, what can we do? Well, we need to have a mobilization like what happened in World War II when they built tanks, hundreds of thousands of tanks, planes, trucks for the war. We had a mobilization in a few years. He said that's what needs to be done to go solar and wind power if our grandkids are going to be living on a planet where uh, we're not underwater and uh, sea levels going up 50 or 60 feet. So if anybody wants any information on this, once again, uh, the, the freestanding books over here are for sale tonight. If anybody wants a starter, uh, come see me. Uh, if you want to browse through the stack here uh, for a few okay. minutes after we get through, okay. I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. If any of you have a group where you'd like to have Ted speak or me or someone else do a presentation, contact us. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the speech. Good, good job you done. Uh, somebody asked a question, who done it? Please give me a break for this. Why? Why did they do it? Please give me a break. Please. The big question tonight should have been how in the hell that a little uh, a kerosene going to cause a building to collapse? Now, 
That was the big question here. Who cared who did it? I don't care who did it. What the official version said, I don't buy it. It's just that simple. Now, I'm a retired, it ain't got nothing to do with nothing else, but I'm retired Chicago violent crime detective. Wow. You don't have to be, uh, doing my job was much of a art is any uh, 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 a science that was involved, and science is involved. But you can have a, 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 a mission in court, circumstance is accepted in the court, just like a witness, just like evidence, whether it's physical evidence, direct evidence, all that is accepted in a, in a court. So what does any non gently problem type person would he or she decide to find out what is this, what is that, what is the best way, and so forth and so on. If ain't nothing wrong with you, you use that, you you eliminate your prejudices, you eliminate your 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 wishes, you eliminate all of that as a detective. I can't go in there and oh I believe this, I believe that, or oh, let me I was suspicious. First of all, you can't even cat that in the court. The judge slap you when you come in and say, Well, I had a hunch you on it, and I laugh at shit. You don't have no hunch. You had evidence. How did you get the evidence? You use your intelligence, you use the art of, of, of detecting in order to find out the truth of the matter. Forget all that other stuff that you uh, the, the brainwashed and, and, and you don't like this and you're passionate about this and you've got feels over this and so forth and so on. People, it doesn't take no expert if they were living at 9-11 and looking at the television um, for, for even standing over there across the river in New Jersey looking at the tower going to say that a fire going to make a building come out? Where you been? Living in a log cabin all your life? <laughs> Lance. Yeah, go ahead. You got four minutes. I won't need four. I won't even need two. First of all, I want to commend you on an awesome presentation. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks for doing this. But I think beyond who did it, I think most of us know who did it. Uh, and even just outside of the question of why, uh, we need to think more about solutions. And for some people, you know, they have their own reasons for not believing, you know, what the government did. It's not for us to judge, but uh, we can't, I would rather us not waste a lot of time reaching back, trying to convince those of the truth, and just focus more on the future and solutions. Because solutions is what we need immediately. Immediately we need solutions. And thanks for your vote. Thank you. Next. Oops. Okay. Four minutes. Okay. I might need all four minutes. I don't know. I just wanted to talk about some of the issues. Thank you again for the presentation. It was great. Um, Judy Wood was mentioned, and I watched a lot of video about her that she gave on the internet. There was a building, I think Building 6, that got bombed out, and it was just totally bombed out. The insides just disappeared. And nobody can explain this. And, and there was talk about, well, you know, what did it? But like she said, like everybody's saying, what does it matter? They have, they have weapons we don't even know about, and they always are you looking for an excuse to experiment with them. There were, she showed there were hundreds and hundreds of cars that got burned out that day. Well, how did that happen? That wasn't caused by jet fuel either. Uh, you pulverized dust. Um, what else? Oh, uh, early on in the news, you had people coming up saying that bombs went off before the planes even went into the buildings. And these were, these were witnesses, these were firemen. People were coming up, their skin burned off. And this was happening before so-called planes crashed into the buildings. Um, there's also a video out on the internet, you can find it, called Hollywood Speaks Out. And it's very interesting because uh, Geraldo Rivera does a flip-flop in this video. At first he calls everybody, um, people with uh, tin hat, tinfoil hats or something who are 911 truthers, when in fact you have physicists, architects, engineers, army people, pilots, doctors, lawyers, Indian, everybody bought people in tinfoil hats. Um, also, C-SPAN, this was interesting, C-SPAN had the architects and engineers on their program. I thought that was pretty cool. And um, I'm also wondering, oh, Building 7, no, you know, that's, Building 7 going down is what got a lot of the architects and engineers 
uh, involved in questioning the whole thing. Um, and I was also very interested in seeing, I, does everybody remember Chris Christie and the whole bridge incident and how everybody was investigating it and I had to have every piece of paper. 911 happens and there's hardly any investigation at all. People find passports on the street and say that guy did it. I mean, it's, it's absolutely insane. And I think it's insane for anybody to believe that <coughs> official fairy tale. It's just nonsense. So as far as the revolution, I'm for it. And I also am for replacing the government with no government. <laughs> Next. Good evening. Uh, when uh, President Clinton was in office, uh, there was some kind of a violent act with a gun, uh, and uh, when Clinton came out to give a talk about it, he uh, could not conceal his joy. And, uh, of course, he moved for legislation to take away more of our gun rights. And they, at that time, did take away quite a few of our gun rights. Uh, like Rahm Emanuel said, uh, never uh, waste a good catastrophe. And uh, we have many uh, um, communists and socialists who use every opportunity they can to try to bring down our institutions. Uh, and uh, our speaker tonight uh, said nothing less than revolution will solve this problem about 9-11. But he failed to say what kind of revolution. Uh, is he talking about a violent revolution to overthrow our American government? Is he talking about a coup to replace the leadership in our government? Uh, as I say, we, we have, there's one gentleman here who makes everything out to be a conspiracy. I'm not going to mention any names. Uh, we have uh, another one who pushes a certain school uh, and um, wants people to join the school. But the school is very much a school that pushes for socialism. So we have many, many people that are working in their own way to bring down our American uh, institutions. And I think it's time that uh, we should wake up to that kind of thing. Thank you. Yes, great job. Go ahead. You got uh, four minutes, okay? Okay, then. So Clock's right here. Okay, uh, what I want to say is that uh, if we want to uh, get some sort of insight into uh, what has happened in uh, 911 and uh, some of the other false flag operations, we have to have some uh, understanding of. Uh, History in order to understand what's going on in the present. And, and Munster goes back into uh, World War II. A lot of people don't know. I'm a chemist by profession, and I can tell you that American Corporation, uh, uh, back during World War II, created an entity called IG Farben, and it was responsible for the rise of uh, Adolf Hitler under the uh, Nazi regime. Uh, and, and those same uh, entities, their descendants today, have puppets, okay, in the form of uh, Bush Cheney uh, and, you know, some of their other uh, uh, proxies. And it is in, it is in that nexus, that, that, that ghost global nexus, where you have to uh, try to look uh, for uh, these, um, these entities, uh, these shadow governments that are behind uh, these uh, atrocities and uh, this, this carnage that we are suffering uh, today. So, you know, please, you know, take a look at these families that, that are responsible and they, and they control these major corporations. And these are the entities uh, behind uh, fabricating of this history uh, that we, we were experiencing today. Thank you. All right. Pat Butler. Yeah. You want to be a militia expert, eh? I do. 
I, I think that would be helpful if we had one here sometime. But that's not so much what I'm concerned about uh, this evening. Um, for one thing, uh, I've heard at least three or four people talking about how wonderful a revolution would be, including our main speaker. Now, there are revolutions and there are revolutions. We had the American Revolution, which was, by revolutionary standards, a fairly moderate revolution. Uh, other countries have not been so fortunate. Therefore, to those who say, we need a revolution, I'd like to know what kind of revolution, who's going to lead it, how are you going to conduct this revolution? Is it going to be a revolution at the polls, or is it going to be a revolution in the streets? If it's a violent revolution, are you aware of the fact that war costs money? How do you fund it? How do you train the people that would be involved in it? How do you train the leadership that would have to be uh, leading this? How do you, if you're going to replace it with a responsible government, or maybe no government at all, as one uh, speaker uh, suggested, uh, if you're going to do that, how are you going to have mechanisms in, in effect to protect us all from the abuses, real or alleged, uh, that brought about the revolution in the first place. This is not the sort of thing that is brought about by smoking funny stuff and funny pipes. This is a very, very carefully thought out, carefully planned, how much do the people know about logistics? How much do the people know about intelligence gathering? How much do the people know about having uh, a medical staff available to take care of the injured? Uh, you know, revolution is not something where we sit in a coffee house and talk about overthrowing the government. Those kinds of revolutions usually end very quickly. If you're talking about a meaningful revolution, you have to ask, what do you want to replace it with? Do you want to replace it with uh, some kind of a new oligarchy? Do you want to replace it with uh, no government at all? In which case, I have to wonder how quickly I can get a ticket to maybe Australia or some other place, because I sure as hell wouldn't want to live in a country where there is no government at all. In the first place, half the people here would probably not get home in one piece tonight if we have no government at all. You may not like the police department, you may not like the army or the navy, but the fact of the matter is these entities protect us to a degree and allow us to carry on conversations like this without getting our heads beaten in by people who don't like what we've said. If you're going to have a revolution, and we have had good revolutions and we've had bad revolutions, know what you're in for. Know what you're looking for. Know what you want. What have you to offer people that they do not presently have at this time? This is not something for amateurs. This is something, this is a very carefully thought out, carefully organized, carefully planned, and I might add, generously funded type of operation. Revolution does not come cheap. I, to those who want revolution, I would suggest they think about it, unless, of course, uh, China North Korea or the uh, Soviet Union are their ideas of utopia. If that's the case, I'm afraid I'll have to ask for a ticket to Australia at least until the country comes back to its senses. Thank you. Okay, hang on, I'm going. All right, let's, uh, well, we got to move here. Let's thank our speaker again, yay. Thanks, that was really good. As a little enforcement, we're going to be doing this again on September the 12th. Uh, okay, I'm going to be collected here very quickly. I pose a simple question after 10 years of investigative research. Very simple question. Uh, could you tell me if you don't like the conventional version, uh, then who did it and how did they do it? And I said, yet to hear anything. This is turning into a cold case. It should belong on the shelf. 
Uh, very simple. It's, it's like reading a mystery novel. Very simply. We've got no further here. All I got additional experiments. Let's see another one of these experiments. And I had one with the watermelon against the brick wall. Doesn't establish who, in fact, did it or how they did it. I don't even know what place it would be. But it, uh, if you were going to trial, you guys aren't ready yet. The other thing is, uh, I followed Ted's recommendation, and he recommended a woman who gave a lecture of about three hours on what happened at the Pentagon according to what she thought. And she claimed, apparently, that a cruise missile painted to look like an airplane, an airline passenger, was sent into the... Uh, Pentagon. But the only thing is, I don't know who fires or owns cruise missiles in the military, but how in the world do you fire one off, shoot it into the Pentagon, and nobody says anything about, about this? And then we say, like, aren't we missing a cruise missile? Doesn't the sergeant say what happened to that one? I mean, this is a little problematic. And I also don't think the uniformed personnel in the military very much believe that it's appropriate under any circumstances to shoot cruise missiles into their fellow per military personnel. And I think somebody would object to doing it, or at least knowing that it happened. Now the other problem with the no planes thing is, we heard tonight, well, there were no planes. There were no bad guys. But we're left with one other thing now. There were, again, I guess, no passengers. Where did they go? These were published in the newspapers. I believe there were memorials, things like that. What happened? I don't know how many passengers there are on these planes, but where did they go? This is a little problematic if you're going to take this position on this. Um, yeah, we, it would, if there was no plane, I guess it was all, everything was fabricated. Nothing, nothing is a false, the videos are false, the passenger was everything. These guys, how did, I don't think it was falsification of everything. Yeah, that's pretty good. But anyhow, thanks a lot. All right, we, we'll get this run. We'll see you again on the 12th. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, we got the uh, Bill Lee. You, you oh, got the last uh, word. Oh, right. Bill, Bill Lee's just, 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 just really quickly, in, in regards to the comment, I, I forgot who it was, that said something about uh, a revolution. It doesn't have to be violent or what we've been told revolution is supposed to look like. And I can tell you that I am part of a couple of teams that has already started a revolution. We have put together, uh, how do you say, uh, uh, committees that will be watching every alderman in the city when they go to report to the mayor to make sure they're addressing what we the citizen need and want and we will be reporting back to our communities what our aldermen are doing instead of electing all of our officials putting them in office and waiting till their term is up to vote them out if they don't take care of their job and we put them in office we'll take them out before they finish their time <laughs> Speaker gets the last word. You're up. <clears throat> Unless Brown's coming. Speaker is our final rebutter. That's you. Uh, <clears throat> Thanks, everybody. Uh, for your comments. <clears throat> okay. Um, well, there's so much here talk about uh, from your rebuttals. Um, let me start with revolution. Yeah, we need a revolution, um, but revolutions do not start with blueprints. Um, they start with ideas. They start with dissatisfaction. They start with uh, general, broad organizing. They start with uh, small, with first small groups, bigger groups, uh, occupy had the potential, I think, to grow into something bigger than it did. You have um, incipient revolutions which don't terminate in the full-blown thing. So you, you might have uh, false starts. You might have uh, you know, first one, second one, third one. 
And these things can take a long time. They can take decades to develop. Um, so the idea um, from the gentleman, I don't know if he's even still here, that you have to like uh, carefully plan, like you know, you're um, drawing up an architectural blueprint. Okay, that I think that's a false idea of how a revolution gets started. Uh, now, once it is it is moving, and once things are really rolling, and uh, all kinds of preliminary uh, things have happened, then the uh, people who are leading the revolution will have uh, start looking for money. They'll start organizing things very in, in more detail. Um, they'll start strategizing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, this notion that you have to have a blueprint for the detailed uh, uh, carrying out of a, of a revolution before you even start, before anything is started, uh, is, I think, a false notion of how revolutions start. Um, uh, the question of violence and revolution is always, to me, uh, pretty silly. Uh, because who are the perpetrators of violence in our society? Um, it's the government and its authorities. And uh, besides, you know, the occasional uh, petty murderer, the big murderers are our government. And when this revolution uh, does get going, uh, they will be the violent, the violent individuals. They'll be uh, literally killing um, the, the movement uh, uh, participants. And uh, the, at that point, the participants, the revolutionaries, might have to ask themselves, well, should we uh, strike back? And that's a perfectly legitimate question. When somebody uh, comes at you with a knife, or worse yet, a, a gun or an uh, M16, you have to you know, consider uh, if you're going to uh, save your own life by striking back. Uh, that, I don't think there's anything uh, illegitimate about that. So I am not a um, uh, ideologically, quote unquote, non-violent person. I am not for violence. And, but who is? What rational person is? Uh, it's a question of strategies in the, in the moment. Um, what else do I, I mean, there's so many things here. Um, who did it and how, as Charlie asked. Um, in order to uh, answer that question definitively, we would have to have an actual uh, forensic and um, criminal investigation by actual prosecutors, like the, in, like the Justice Department of the United States. What's the problem with that picture? Just, that's the government. They would be prosecuting themselves. They're not even going to get started on that, uh, doing that. It's a waste of time to think about uh, going in that kind of direction. Um, now, as a matter of fact, uh, Cheney, Dick Cheney was in charge on 9-11. He was officially, technically in charge of the government on 9-11. And he was sitting there in, in the bunker of the White House uh, doing all kinds of machinations. If, if we, to, to, to get to the point where we know exactly what he was doing, what he, who, he, who, he, what he, um, excuse me, who he was calling, what he was saying, uh, what he was typing on his computer, whatever, okay, that would be this forensic investigation that would be uh, something that would be required. They would be Sitting in the White House is not a crime. No, no. But to figure out exactly how he carried out this crime would require uh, an agency much larger than any 9-11 truth uh, you know, investigator. Um, and that would require a, a movement to get that going, not just me or a handful of people speaking out. Um, this gentleman talked about um, shadow governments and families that control corporations. Well, that's very interesting, and you know uh, that can inform us on, on some of the actors behind the scenes. But I think we have to start with the actual people who are in office, who are, who are actually controlling things, uh, making laws, uh, signing executive orders. Um, we're talking about the president, uh, congressmen, uh, uh, justice, uh, excuse me, uh, Supreme Court justices, uh, mayors. Okay, those individuals are, are not behind the scenes. They're right there in, behind microphones. They're on TV every night, right? Uh, we have to start with those people, um, and we have to get rid of them. So, and so that kind of leads me to the question, answering the question of what kind of revolution. Revolution, uh, essentially, is about changing the form of government and starting up a new government. Okay, so then, and that I have answered. Um, if you look on my website, democracyforusa.org, um, I explain the kind of uh, government that we need. And I'm not talking about no government. Uh, and I'm not talking about some kind of oligarchical government, it would be a democratic government. So check, it, check that out on democracyforusa.org. And I, uh, by the way, for those of you who may not know, I've had uh, a couple other presentations where I discussed that issue specifically, the, the kind of government that we need. So it's not as if I haven't uh, uh, discussed and answered that kind of, those kinds of questions. Um, there's so many things to go over. Let me um, just wrap up by saying that this movement that we're talking about, um, if we don't get that going, who's going to get it going? 
So I'm asking all of you, and I wish that people would stay, but uh, uh, check, ch uh, check out my YouTube video, check out my, uh, our website, marksfusa.org, and you have my uh, email address if you don't, um, uh, I'll give it out to you again in, in those little slips I passed out, and we can start things ourselves. If not us, who? Viva la Reagan Revolution! All right.